So uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I think we'll probably get started here in like 20 seconds. In the meantime, uh, I want to drop a link for you all. I'm sure you already have it. Um, there is uh, an external drive that's available um, that if you are, let's see, if you're signed up for the meeting, you should have gotten linked to this external drive, but I'll drop it in the chat here. Um, this is going to be useful in today's meeting just because there is a, a quick demo of a MedExpress uh, functionality of one of the questions that we received, as well as a document that has a list of all of the questions that we received so far, um, along with the answers from our team. So if you're looking to follow along or if you need to access this afterwards, in addition to the video or the recording that'll be available after this meeting, you also will have access to this docs. So um, as, as we go through it, you can follow along. Um, find out uh, what the answers are. And if you have further questions, um, I do encourage you to submit them to Slido. I'll drop that in the chat as well. Uh, the Slido will stay active until um, the end of the session today. If you do have any further questions after um, today's tutorial session or the Q&A session, please submit them via the discussions page in GitHub, and uh, we'll respond to them accordingly. OK, um, so without further ado, let's uh, get underway. So the first question that we had, and I'll share a screen here. Um, window. So I'm going to share with you, uh, if I can find it. <laughs> let's see. There it is. OK, yes, allow. OK. so. I'm going to share with you the Slido questions over here so you can see them. Uh, and then we'll uh, increase the size of this. Hopefully everybody can see this all right. Um, I'm going to be going down kind of on the, because when this was copied over to the Google Docs, if you're checking that out, it was copied over in the most popular. Um, and then it was also divided up by category. So I'll be trying to stick to um, the Slido order, um, which is also the Google Docs, but it might jump around. Um, so the first question that we got is, are there operational web pages we can view as examples where MetPlus has been automated and is running daily? Um, and as uh, Tara suggested, uh, or as Tara uh, added to this file and I'll present, um, EMC is transitioning over to MetPlus currently. So there are only a few items available, but there are items available. Um, so if we follow that link, I'll copy that and put that over here. We can see that we have multiple options. Um, the three that uh, Tara highlighted for us were the GFS Global. So if we go into the Global here, we click on GFS Verification. And we actually do have a little blurb down here saying the verification is done using EMC Verif Global, which uses MET Plus. Um, and that'll give you access to all of the um, all the verification models that you want to see. Um, and then if you want more documentation, you can get it there. So if you want to look at the anomaly cor fit, uh, correlation coefficient or RMSE, um, those images are being loaded uh, via uh, Met, Met Plus. Um, we also have the opportunity to go to the SREF, the regional version. So if we go, so if we go back here, and we go to SREF, which should be, I believe, in the regional. That's correct. So if we go to regional, we'll have our SREF over here, SREF versus GEFs of limited area. And same thing here. So this you'll be able to check out whatever fields you want. And all of these will be accessible uh, via MET+. Plus. And then finally, um, there's the clouds field. Um, I'll just quickly jump into that precipitation and cloud cover and precipitation verification are both currently being done um, uh, via MET Plus. Uh, it sounds like there is a note. Oh, sorry, John, that was just me. I put the link to the website you were using in the chat too. Perfect, thank you. All right, um, so that thank you for your question. Hopefully that answers it, Austin. Um, I'm going to actually bounce over here and mark it as answered here. 
All right. Um, and then additionally, if as like as those um, more and more come on, I'm sure we'll see more and more being produced by Med Plus uh, on that web page. So, uh, and as Alicia put into the chat, you can get access to that web page via that URL or in the document. The URL is placed in there as well. Um, the next question is: Is there a Met Plus module? Um, or I guess let's let's stick to the, the documentation here that's in the Google Docs. As far as documentation and where to start first, do you recommend always starting at the Met Plus level or at the Met level first? So that's um, another Austin question here. Um, this is going to be personal preference. It really depends on what your goal and your experience level are. And this is just my own personal experience. Everybody's going to have a different idea of what um, should be happening or how uh, how best to access the documentation. Um, personally, I find that if you're doing multiple tools or if you want to do um, conversions between file formats as well as um, pulling out statistics, um, doing um, stat aggregation, um, or trying to do stats across time, it will make more sense to actually start on the Met Plus side of things. Um, if you are just getting into Met Plus for the first time, if you're not quite sure how to do what you want to do, um, if you've never played around with any of the Met tools before, um, I do suggest starting in Met. Um, the documentation is that was the first part written was Met. Um, Met Plus was built on afterwards to accommodate all the ideas of pulling tools together multiple times, not having users write their own Python wrappers. Um, so it's sometimes easier to just start with one tool. Um, understand how that works, and then move on to, okay, well, now that I understand these two tools, let's understand how to wrap them together, and then you can move on to Met Plus. Um, I do suggest that even as you move on to Met Plus, um, and you become more confident in chaining tools together and listing processes and running them multiple times, um, that you do check back in with the Met documentation if you run into issues. Um, sometimes Met Plus will run perfectly fine, um, but error out for some reason, and you can't quite understand why. And it's because you're setting something incorrectly or you're not providing information in a way that Met can use it. But if you read um, the user's guide for Met, you can usually find that answer in the tool. Um, again, this is just personal uh, personal advice. You might find that you can just jump right into Met Plus and it just makes more sense that way. And you might find that Met is more complicated or vice versa. Um, this is just my own suggestion. Um, is there a question or a comment we have? Uh, Philip asked a question, is there everything in the link generated by Met, Met Plus? Um, as of right now, I believe the answer is no. Um, we're slowly getting to that point, but there's only a few um, uh, products that are being generated via Met Plus, and those ones are listed inside the document, um, the Google Drive document that I linked to. So jumping back over here to the Slido. Thank you, Austin. Um, Let's go and find out what the next question is going to be. Um, so these next two are both related to Python embedding. And we did get two questions related to the uh, NCF5 data. So um, we'll tackle both those at the same time. Uh, the first question I got is, is there a MetPlus module that I can import uh, in Python to work with my X-Array data? Or do I need to write data to file and then call MetPlus from the command line? Um, so thank you to thank you to Dan um, on our team for presenting this information or for gathering this information. I'll present it on his behalf. Um, so X-Array is actually a me accessible form of memory. Um, an example of this, which I can put together over here for you, is this one. So this is actually a script. Um, that uh, I believe, oh, OK, yeah. So this is this actually just demonstrates uh, an X-Array um, being called and set up. And then you'll see that you'll set up an attributes file. So there is a proper way to do this. Um, and for the proper usage, what you're going to do is you're going to read your data into Python via X-Array. Um, you're going to subset that data into a 2D data array. 
and then define the Python dictionary with the necessary attributes. And in that Google Docs that's in the, our session seven um, folder, you'll find uh, a link to um, the uh, section in the user's guide in MET, which tells you all of the things that you need to fill in in that Python dictionary, all the attributes that are necessary. And you can see down here in our script, I'll zoom in a little bit. Here we're setting those um, the dictionary up so that it can be read in. And you also set define a grid that these data are going to fall on. Um, so after you've uh, after you've put that into a 2D data array and you've defined that Python dictionary with the necessary attributes, um, you can also, by the way, you can also modify existing attributes um, in the data array to follow the MET naming conventions. That will work. Um, it's just usually easier if you just set it up yourself uh, on the side as a Python library um, or a Python dictionary. My bad. Um, and then uh, be sure to rename or copy the data array to a new MET data. Um, when MET is looking for information, it's looking for one named MET data, um, which I believe we'll find up here, uh, MET data right here. So we're pull, pulling it in and naming it that. That's what it expects the data array to be called. And then you'll call this in your Python um, in your uh, configuration file via Python embedding. Um, there's different ways to do that. Again, um, in the Appendix F, um, where it discusses Python embedding, it describes the different ways to do that. You'll have to, um, there's multiple ways that you can set up Python embedding, depending on if you're calling in the tool, that's just for MET. And then MET Plus, um, there's multiple examples, and I'll show you actually in the next question um, how to call a Python script from your configuration file in MET+. Plus. Um, a lot of use cases that we have set up in the repository will call that. And actually, if you go to the MET tool wrapper section, um, which I can go really quickly to read uh, MET+, plus, read the docs. So we'll jump over here to the use cases, to the MET tools. So these are only wrapping a single tool. These are not use cases. Um, You'll see that some of them say using Python embedding, using Python embedding. Um, that means that these use cases or these wrappers, configuration files, will demonstrate how to call a script from your MET Plus configuration file. So if you're ever curious of how to do it, um, this is usually a very, very good place to start because it's a very simple one tool call um, to be able to do that. And then let's jump over. John, yeah. Hank yes. has his hand up. Yes, go ahead, Hank. Yeah, John, I was, I was going to add one thing to this. Um, I, I think that you're answering the question that was actually asked, but um, you can't, so you can actually import MET Plus as a module in Python. Um, I don't think that we, and that will give you access to all of the wrapper tools. I don't think that we have any right now that take an X-Array and then sort of run its magic. But you, do, you can import MET Plus as a module. Um, and then um, if you, you know, want to write your own scripts to go from there, that's certainly possible. Um, so just, that's just a little bit of extra information. Uh, and thank you. That's, that, that's a great point. There are ways to get around these stuff or do something a little bit differently. And like you said, there's right now we don't have that really set up um, as an example uh, to touch on. But if, if you're looking to do that, um, reach out in discussions and we can start helping you do that. There's also a question in, um, in chat. Sure. Um, let's take a look. Um, I guess I'm not seeing it. Is that uh, Philip's question? Yeah, I think that's directed maybe at Alicia with the uh, verification. Yeah, I, I tried to touch on that before. That um, so the ones that are in the document that I discussed are really um, the ones that are uh, currently being generated. So right now we have the GFS in the global section, the SREF in the regional section, and um, clouds actually in the precip clouds region are being that's generated right, via MEP+. 
Okay, yep. thanks, Alicia, for the confirmation. <laughs> and it, uh, like I said, as we as things get moving on the Met Viewer Met Express side, and there are a few questions that we're going to be touching on about this. Um, more and more products are going to be generated by Met Plus. It's just taking some time to get that transferred over. Uh, but good questions. Um, so the next question, which we're going to touch on, is going to be um, the so oh one last point on the X-ray. The X-ray um, data array, the two D data array, is what you should be using. Do not call it with X-ray data set. Um, that structure is not supported in Met. So just make sure you understand that um, that uh, if you are setting up and you get an error, make sure that you're not trying to use data set X-ray instead. Um, and then I believe that uh, Hank has put in some additional information inside of calling Met Plus as a Python module. Um, so thanks for that, Hank. Um, the next question we're going to touch on is the HDF5 stuff. This will actually tackle two questions. Um, one that was placed in a few days ago and then one was placed in, I believe, this morning. Um, first question surrounding this is, is it reasonable to expect that I could calculate anomaly correlation and RMS error scores on HDF5 GIOS data uh, by implementing Python wrappers. An additional question that touched on this is, is there any way to pre-process or convert HDF5 files or .hfi files to be used in MEP plus? Um, standard approaches like NCO return NC files, but they still cannot be used by MET. Um, and that's, that's, a, that's a really good question. Obviously, a lot of people want to know this. Um, so as uh, Dan indicated in the document, again, I'm just presenting his work. Um, the, currently, there is no support for directly reading in NC4 or HDF5 files via MET+. Plus. Um, we just have support for GRIB, GRIB1, and GRIB2. Um, NetCDF files that follow uh, CLIMO format or CF, or CF compliant, and um, ones generated by uh, the MET itself. Um, but that's why we have things like Python embedding. Um, this gives you an opportunity to read in basically any data format that might be non-native to MET and get it in a format that MET can use. Um, you can, uh, it looks like a little bit was added uh, last night. You can now, as of beta 4, load the metdata db module and use metreadnc.util.readnetcdf to load a netcdf file into an X-ray or pandas data set, which is good. Um, yeah, that, that's that's me again causing problems. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, so we do have some examples of reading in a netcdf file um, directly into an X-ray and then using, um, you know, sending it to PlotPy or CalcPy. Again, uh, you know what what you said is correct. We we don't have um, Met Plus wrappers that read in netcdf directly like that and then send them to met functions but we, we do have the ability to read that cdf um and you know hopefully in the future we can expand the capabilities of that great thank you hank appreciate the update on that didn't actually know that um i i'm what i'm showing right now is a script that we got via nrl um that does read in um i believe uh, HDF files. Um, so this has not been completely cleared um, by the Met Plus team, nor is it available in a repo use case yet. Um, but this does give you hopefully a bit of an example that, you know, by importing the right tools um, and getting your file in a format um, that's more standard, um, it, it, you can feed in just about anything you want into MET, um, as long as it's either grid or point data, and as long as it's passed in a format um, that's uh, accessible to MET. So um, while this was a script that was, uh, I guess I, I had put that in there. Um, so this is, a, a, this is a script that reads in the data and gets it into a format that's close to um, what MET needs. And then there's an additional wrapper script um, that a user created. So this isn't, uh, I'll use a different word. It's uh, the driver script, I guess, um, that will call this script to grab data and then adds on 
the dictionary that we just saw in the previous question, um, the attributes dictionary, and then we'll be able to pass that to whatever met tool that you'd like to call it on. So this this is available for you to take a look at. It is up in GitHub, and I can drop the the link in the chat. It's also the document um, in case you want to see it there. Um, John HG, it looks like you got a question or you have a message. Yes. So um, I I res I added some more um, you know thoughts on the HDF five issue to the bottom of the Google Doc. Um, I just wanted to go over a couple more points regarding that. So um, Met actually, when we compile it, it does link to the HDF5 library. And that's because NetCDF4, HDF5 is a dependency for NetCDF4. So NetCDF4 files are actually HDF5 files, but with uh, they're just a customized version of it. So um, it is kind of enticing to support HDF5 directly. The, the challenge is, um, is the metadata. So whereas for in NetCDF, John, John already mentioned the, the CF for the climate forecast conventions, um, which define how the metadata like the grid definition, the timing information, all that should be specified. I'm not aware of a corresponding set of conventions for HDF5, um, but if one of those exists, it seems like one of those should exist, I, I guess is my point. And um, that, that would that would enable us to to add support for HDF five directly, which I it, you know as it as it gets more widely used and as Met Plus gets applied to more data sets, I think that that's a good idea because you know the overall goal with Met Plus is to make the task of doing verification easier and struggling with data file formats is not easy, um, even even when there is a way to do it through Python embedding, it obviously is preferable if the tools can just read them directly. So um, whoever posted this, you could consider starting a, a, Met Plus, a, dis, a discussion, a Met Plus discussion, where we could talk about, um, you know, you mentioned that there's some standard NCO tool that converts it to NetCDF. I'm not, I'm not familiar with that. So if you could provide um, an example of the, of the tool and what input and output looks like, um, we could, you know, potentially in the future support the HDF5 directly and or support the the reformatted NetCDF. You know, John mentioned that we support three flavors of NetCDF conventions right now. Um, if if this is a widely used standard convention that NCO is writing to, um, then we could add that as a as a fourth convention that we also support. That's it. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, John. Um, and this is also a plug for our next tutorial session. I'm brushing over very briefly that all these Python embedding, and I'm sure that it's it's kind of confusing that sometimes you hear about Python wrappers around Met tools, and then you also hear about Python embedding. Um, try to try to understand that um, the Python wrappers, when you typically hear that, what we're talking about is Met Plus. Um, we have a repository set up so that we can run use cases that utilize multiple Met Plus tools. Um, and also, when you're running through the user's guide and you look through the use cases, those are all calling those Python wrappers. When we're discussing Python embedding, it's usually a script that you provide or you're creating um, that's called during the running of a MET tool so that you can either do a little pre-processing to get the data in the format that MET can understand um, or to do a calculation on the fly and pass that into MET as a field, um, again, to do more uh, calculation. But ultimately, that Python embedding is the script that you create. And the plug is that next week, we're going to be actually covering um, uh, Python embedding and some of the tools that we're going to use. And then I'll give you a much better understanding of how to set up a Python script yourself to read in data um, and then pass it to Met to do the statistical analysis that you want. So uh, if you are interested in understanding a little bit more about Python embedding and how to work with Met, um, definitely attend uh, next, next week's tutorial session. Um, so moving on, uh, we're into the TC-related area. Um, so the, the first question in this area, and I'll pass off to John HG for this, is can MetPlus calculate the mean spread of ensemble TC tracks? OK, great, thanks. Um, and you know, I, we've been uh, talking with Jai from, from EMC about uh, this issue uh, over the last couple of weeks. And um, the short answer, actually, let me find my notes here, sorry. Um, so the short answer is that the, the TC pairs tool um, in MET 
it reads forecast um, or it forecast ATCF track data and best track data. So um, these are the ATCF data is just an ASCII file format which contains track information. And it reads in the uh, the forecast and the analysis tracks and then pairs them up. And one of the options in TC pairs in the configuration file is to define a consensus track. And a consensus track is really just you, you define the models that comprise a consensus. And the location of the consensus is just the average location of each of the, the, the input models tracks at, this, at that time. And the, the intensity is also just the average of the intensities. So from that perspective, you know, you could use the consensus track to define uh, an ensemble mean track. However, um, it does not also compute the spread. Um, and so there, there is kind of no, I'm not aware of kind of a mechanism or a way that we would, would store the spread in the output. So we actually have a meeting scheduled with uh, the folks from EMC for February 1st to do some more brainstorming about how we can how met plus or how how the met tools should be enhanced to handle the ensemble spread so short answer ensemble mean yes spread no um any other follow-up or questions about that john i admit that i'm the anonymous that asked that question okay. and i asked it before <laughs> we met yesterday. So um, thank you. And that is super clear. And I look forward to that meeting on February 1st. Great. Thanks, Alicia. I just, so I just have a follow-up question today. So there's no mechanism to calculate the spread for tracks, but is there for like graded data? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, okay, uh, so, when you, so. yeah, so in, in MET um, version 10.0, there's a tool called Ensemble Stat. And it reads in, you know, gridded fields of your ensemble members and can derive uh, ensemble mean and spread and, and a variety of other ensemble things. And um, then it can also compute ensemble statistics. And we haven't covered that yet, yet in the training okay. session yet. But yeah, this question is really specifically about um, tracks. So the track, generally, the way it works is you run your model, you get your gridded model output, and you're in a tracker on it to extract the look, you know, the location of storm tracks. And those are stored in this ATCF uh, ASCII file format. And then the, the TC pairs tool met reads that ASCII output, not the, not the gridded data. Got it. Thanks. Yep. John Opatz, what's next? Yeah, thank you. I just want to make sure we didn't have any more good follow-up questions. Um, so the next question we had, which is also pertaining to TC related um, questions is, can we see a start to finish example of tropical cycle and track and intensity error analysis, including the analysis files, forecast files, and best track data? So um, uh, currently right now, there's no use cases showcasing this feature. And that's because you'd need to do a TC pairs and a TC stat um, to actually get this all together along with um, uh, a plot. Uh, for your stats. So if you're in the document, you'll see um, a figure that was placed there to kind of outline this. And I'll just briefly describe it for people who are not in the um, document or can't access it. Uh, you'll need to feed in an A and a B deck into TC pairs tool. Um, that'll give you an ASCII output, which is then fed into the TC stat tool, um, which will produce your statistical output. And then depending on what you want out of a plot, you'll then use your own plotting mechanism via uh, PlotPy or CalcPy or MetViewer or MetExpress. Um, and then you'll get your stat plots out of that. Um, right now, like I said, there isn't a use case that actually showcases a TC pairs and TC stat. However, we do have use cases that do each of those separately. Very quickly, I'm going to pull up um, this one which is just the very basic use case of TC pairs. Um, this is uh, one of just the tools being wrapped itself uh, under Met Tool wrapper, TC pairs, TC pairs, extra tropical. Um, and you can, you can access this right now uh, in the, the latest version that's released. Uh, it, it should run fine and it'll give you an idea how to run TC pairs. And there's an, uh, an existing one as well. And I'll, uh, pull that one up as well here. Um, there's one for uh, 
TC pairs. Uh, that was TC pairs again. Why is there we go? Apologies. Let's try that again. There we go. This is the TC stat basic use case. Same idea that you can run this if you have Met Plus installed somewhere um, along with the Met. Um, you can run this, get an idea of how each of these tools runs separately, and that would be your opportunity to start learning Met Plus is put these things together. Um, what I also want to stress is that we're always looking for user created use cases. Um, this is not something that, you know, you have to wait for us to come to you or, you know, if you want to start a discussions page with us, by all means. Um, and we might be able to work with you and set up a use case, um, especially if we have um, a partnership with your uh, organization already. But there is a section under the Met Plus user's guide called the contributor's guide, which will walk through all of the steps you'll need to take to try to set up your own use case. And actually in section eight here, you'll be able to go right to the adding use cases and get an idea of what you need to do to add a use case to our repository. Um, there are steps in here where you'll have to rely on us and that's where we'll have to have some back and forth, get an idea of what you've been working on and if it's a good fit um, for the repository. But we always encourage users to work on their own data because they know it best um, and then work with us on getting that use case set up inside Met Plus, because you might be able to help others uh, in your organization and outside your organization um, with these kinds of use cases. Um, so by all means, please investigate um, the contributor's guide if you'd be comfortable um, putting together a use case and working with us. And like I said, there's plenty of things in there about coding standards, um, how to set up your own wrapper, creating a con environment if that's necessary. It's all there. Um, it sounds like there was either a question or a link sent. Uh, John, I, I just raised my hand. I, I wanted yes. to um, uh, also mention that, I, you know, it's, it's kind of a question for Hank and Minna if they're on the call, because I, I know that Tatiana's out today. Um, so we relatively recently enhanced, or in the last year, enhanced uh, it so that we could load TC data into the MET database um, so that could be plotted by, you know, by MET Express and MET Viewer. Um, so that's a, a new a new enhancement. So in, in that flow chart you showed where you where users would run TC pairs and TC stat and then run a, a custom script to plot the result. Um, that that you know either either to as of today or or in the near future can be done by met viewer uh and or met express excellent so capabilities abound which is great um it, john is there some way where we, we can record that inside the document sure i'll make a note of it okay thank you all right, um, so moving on to the next category, which is uh, tutorial practice. Um, the question was asked, if I want to try and run tutorials in the DTC provided AWS instance, but with GIOS data, can I try that? Is there a disk space limitation for SCPing to AWS? Um, so after speaking with the team, um, it, we're not really going to allow this. We're not going to be able to accommodate this. The main reason being uh, cost. Uh, we're keeping these... Uh, instances up is not cheap. Um, it is there for your use, but it's got to be strictly for the use cases um, that we've approved and we've set up for this tutorial. There's also a uh, potential for bad actors. If we do open up things to allow people to upload data, um, it does create a potential security risk. And if people are uploading data files that are huge, um, or if we're trying to manage traffic of people uploading things, it creates a whole new process of, okay, you'll need to submit your, um, your request. We have to review it. We have to approve it or deny it. Then we have to help you get it moved, make sure it's in the right area. There's, there's a lot of complications by trying to accommodate that ability. Instead, uh, what we strongly encourage you to do is use your local installations. Um, inside that uh, shared drive that everybody should have access to, there is a list of who's participating. Um, I'll quickly pull that up here so you can see it. 
Um, and all of you have access to this, and um, you'll be able to see the affiliation of every individual that's in here. I strongly encourage you to look through there and find people from your office or your organization um, that are also taking this. And there is a very good possibility that MetPlus may be installed in a common area that you can access. Or maybe you can be the person to kick it off and say, hey, let's get MetPlus installed in here. Um, additionally, there is a... Um, an idea that you should be able to clone your own AMI. Hank, uh, do you want to speak to that since you're typing on it? I would love to, and I'll fill that in. But yeah, so the um, the, the current Met Plus tutorial um, is available as a uh, publicly available as an AMI. Um, it's got it does not have beta five loaded on it, but it does have beta four loaded in um, along with all of the tutorial data and config scripts that you're using right now. So you should, if you have access to your own AWS space, you should be able to just find that AMI, um, clone it and, and start, um, start running your own instance um, with all of that tutorial data, and then you're welcome to SCP as much data as you want to that uh, to that instance yourself. Um, so that, that that certainly is available, and we will be updating that AMI as we release new software. So um, yes, certainly a, a good option. Thanks, Hank. I appreciate that. And uh, as Hank's uh, talking about this, he's also going to capture it in the document. So again, thank you for putting that. Um, that's definitely the route we want to take on this. Um, so we won't be accommodating any SCP requests. Um, if there are any questions about getting set up on here, again, uh, please post to the, the GitHub discussions and um, somebody can, on the team will be able to walk you through how to get set up with your own uh, clone of an AMI. Um, so for this next one, the MetPlus configuration file setup, uh, I'll pass this off to George, but the question being, for time and control, why two sets of variables, init or valid, is end time processing different when the final loop is in the past versus in the future? Hey, John. Um, so to address the first question, why are there two sets of variables? Um, this is asking if, um, so if you set loop by equal to init or retro, then you have to set the init time format, init begin, init end, init increment. Uh, whereas if you set loop by equals valid or real time, you have to send, set the corresponding valid variables such as valid time format, valid begin, et cetera. Um, the reason we have separate, separated these into two groups of variables um, is to really make it easier at a glance to see which, um, which time format you're using, if it's initialization or valid time. Um, it also helps to ensure that the user user is consciously aware that if they're changing the time values to a different time, that they make sure they update the um, the values. Uh, it's sort of rare that if you could switch the value for loop by that you would not that you would not have to update these other variables. Um, so that kind of gives you a, an extra step to make sure that you're consciously thinking about the values that you're changing here, and you're not just switching it to use um, init in place of valid and vice versa and and not being kind of aware of what you're what else you need to change um, if it, enough users are, are sort of bothered by this extra step of having to to switch uh, the variable names um, we could consider adding support for a sort of generic name of variables such as uh, time format time begin time end time increment um, that would be used if the corresponding valid and init variables are not set um, so if that's something that that users um, you know are really bothered by and would prefer to have that option, uh, then please let us know and we can add support for that. Uh, to answer the second question about uh, the end time um, in the past compared to the beginning time, um, currently the Met Plus wrappers do not support looping backwards in time. Uh, so if the end time is earlier than the begin time, then an error will be reported and and the wrappers will not run. Um, if they're the same time, then it will just process that first runtime and end. Um, if, if, if there is a desire for support for looping backwards in time um, and enough users let us know that that's something that they need for their use case, then uh, we can certainly add that. But currently, that is not supported. And I think that answers that question. Yeah, thank you, George.
Okay. Um, and again, highlighting the importance of if you do have um, suggestions or comments or something you'd like to change, please utilize the GitHub discussions page. It's a great opportunity or a great uh, availability to not just talk with us, the team, but uh, the community at large might be able to help you if you just have questions with things. Um, so uh, quickly moving on, one of the questions, uh, the next one was uh, how do I, um, how, or I guess in this, how do you, uh, how do you create anomaly correlation coefficient die-off curves? Uh, can we see an example with the FB3 GFS output? Um, so for time's sake, we're not going to be able to do one live, but um, I can point you in the direction of where you can get these and make them yourselves. Um, so I'm going to drop in the chat here. Um, the link to MedExpress. It is as simple a link as you expect. Um, but this is the link to the MedExpress. Um, you can take a look there. Inside the uh, session folder for today, and I'll pull it up here, um, there is a PowerPoint presentation that will show you how to produce um, a die-off curve in MedExpress. So with that link I just sent in the chat, along with this presentation, which is available in the session folder, um, it'll give you a step-by-step -step process of how to create your own die-off curves. Now, this is with data that is preloaded, um, so it, it might not be exactly um, your data and uh, what you want to see, but this does show the capabilities of MedExpress being able to do this. And CalcPy and PlotPy will eventually be able to do this as well. And MetViewer actually is able to do this. I was um, given access to an image here, and I'll pull this up. Um, EMC is currently constructing uh, ACC die-off curves. Uh, so I'll put this up here. Um, this is just an image. Um, from their website showcasing uh, the, the curves as well that they're doing um, live um, or operationally. Um, MetViewer does have an XML script for this, um, but as the website, let me grab it real quickly. As the website indicates, this is restricted to uh, no employees at this time. Um, but down here, we do have um, the die-off curves here, the anomaly correlation coefficient. And this is just an XML file. So you can load that very quickly and uh, see it from Met, uh, Met Viewer. But as I explained up here, oh, it should be, or at least it was. Um, uh, does anybody have any information on that from our team to make sure? I, yeah, it says here, MedViewer is only available to no employees. Is that still true? Yeah, that's still true. Okay, thank you. Um, so for right now, um, those XML files will only be usable by no employees, but MedExpress is open to the public. So um, by all means, use that link and use that uh, PowerPoint guide to step through and check out um, uh, some ACC die-off curves. Uh, so, if, for the sake of time, we'll try to move on to the next question. Um, for this one, uh, it's going to be uh, Tina, hopefully, is in the meeting with us. Um, the question was, how can I use the MetPlus tool to track a mesoscale system, or MCS, from small to mature stage? And if you can show an example from WARF output, it would be great. Yeah, so um, the the best tool for this is um, probably going to be mode in the time domain. Mode is the object-based tracking. Um, am, am I able to share my screen so I can show? Let me just stop sharing mine. OK. Let me see. So mode is the object-based um, diagnostics. and. Uh, mode in the time domain runs it through time. So uh, an easy way to find the tools that you need in MET is to go to the user's guide and then uh, coming down MET plus quick search for use cases. If you click on that, you get a sorting of use cases by different, um, you know, in different ways. So the top is different tools. Um, the below that is applications organ uh, by the organization by file format. And so I can go down here to mode time domain, and then I get a listing of 
uh, mode time domain use cases. So here we can go to the MTD six hour QPF use case. So this uses her, we don't have a wharf example uh, handy or ready, but um, this specific use case um, runs her against MRMS radar data and um, will track mode or will track an MCS in the time domain. And so um, an example of See, if I go into um, an example of running this uh, would be to use this configuration file down here, param use cases, model applications, precipitation, mrms.conf. Uh, and the output that you get from this is um, three files. So um, let me... Let me get these listed up here. So the output that you get from this is three files. So the 2D file contains the 2D objects tracked through time. The 3D file contains 3D objects. And then the NC file shows your objects through time. This example is actually run, it's three forecast lead times, but it's run for the same valid time. So if I view this output, um, it, uh, the objects look very similar from, whoops, the objects look very similar from time to time because they're all for the same valid time. So if you were running it for tracking an MCS, you would want to run it probably over different times, different valid times, and you would have different objects. So here's my objects and I can um, move forward in time and you can see how they change a little bit. There's only three times. But so for tracking um, an MCS from early to mature stage, a uh, mode in the time domain, I think is going to be your best option where you can get object attributes. Um, so did that answer the question? All right, I'm gonna assume yes, since I didn't hear anymore. I think so. they're stunned with your answer, so. <laughs> That's that's no, and, and that's great. Um, as as Tina, thanks Tina for putting that there. Um, and I think we do have a link to that um, use case in the document. Is that correct? Um, I haven't updated the document yet, but there will be one in there. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, if again, if you do have any more questions on the tools that we're talking about or discussing, take a look at the user's guide. Get an idea of what they are and how they run. Try to run them yourself. Um, and if uh, if you do have more questions or there's issues running it, that's time to use the GitHub discussions. Um, so moving on, um, we're going to move on to the potpourri section. Um, is so the question from here is: Is there any filtering capacity plan for the detection of hidden features in raw data sets? Example of waves or others. And for this, I'll hand it off to John H. G. Hey, John, could you uh, share your screen again? Yes, absolutely. OK. Um, and actually, can you scroll down? Because Tara put in a nice picture here um, in, into the Google Doc. Oh, into the Google Doc. Yeah. yeah. Let me uh, stop sharing this, oh. and I'll sh share the Google Docs instead. So there's no, I, I, I had a hard time kind of interpreting um, what this means. There's no, you know, I thought, any filtering capability to detect hidden features. I thought there's no, there's no, um, you know, like artificial intelligence that we're using to look for, uh, to, to scan raw fields for, for features. Um, that being said, you know, we've already mentioned Python embedding. So you're welcome to read in, you know, use Python embedding, uh, read it in, read, you read multiple fields of data in, perform whatever sort of analysis you want to create a gridded data set and pass that gridded data set and or point observations and pass that data in memory to the MET tools for further processing. So um, we can't kind of detect hidden features in that way, but if, if you know what you're looking for and can write a Python script to find it, um, then you can pass it to MET uh, via Python embedding. However, there is also, um, so, there, there's a, a variation of mode called multivariate mode, um, which it, there's an initial capability included in MET version 10.0. There, there are several GitHub issues that we have defined to clean it up, uh, make it work better. 
but the idea here is that instead of defining so what you know when you run mode or mode time domain you you pass in a single input field uh you smooth the data out and you define a threshold or apply a threshold to define objects um, from a single field of input with multivariate mode the idea is that you in this example here you're you're passing in three inputs into mode and we're defining objects from each of those inputs so the specific humidity gradient is the first field in the top left in the top middle there's the temperature gradient and then 10 meter uh, wind direction shift in the top right uh top right image and using those uh three objects from those three input fields we combine them we, we define some uh, object uh, combination logic to pull out a dry line um so and, and this is all configured via, or this is all controlled via a, a configuration file for multivariate mode uh, without any Python in, embedding in, involved. You could, of course, do this with Python embedding yourself, but then you would have to read in these, these three input fields, um, you know, define objects, define the object combination logic, and then pass that in memory to, to mode. So there's a link to, uh, Lindsay Blank uh, is a former employee of the DTC, and she she was the one who was spearheading this development. And there's a link to uh, her AMS talk about this approach. Um, so that that's that's one cool new thing that we're we're working on and hope to get cleaned up more in future versions. Um, any questions or follow up about about multivariate mode? Okay, thanks. And thank you, John. Appreciate it. Um, the, the next question, we're going to just kind of speed through the last ones here just so we can meet our time or stay close to time. Uh, one of the an anonymous ant questioner asked, is it possible to compute a R? And unfortunately, um, this highlights, you know, the, the issues we have in science. It's not quite clear what a R is. Um, I'm going to quickly run through this in case this does answer it. But if the person who asked the question is on the line, um, feel free to, you know, unmute yourself and let us know. Um, so if it, you're asking for atmospheric river, it can be identified using thresholding and, and mold and multivariate mode. Um, as we saw uh, Tina just demonstrate, that is um, one of the tools that we have an option for. And we have use cases set up as. So take a look at that and that um, via thresholding, you can actually back out what the atmospheric river is. But if you are asking for an annual return period for hydro, um, no, that is not currently available in any of the tools. Um, it's it's kind of a specialized process, and as we've kind of highlighted, when you get into inputs or outputs that require specialized calculations that are not, um, you know, default statistics like your RMSE, uh, ACCs, um, that's probably something that should be tackled outside of MetPlus via Python script. Um, is the questioner on the line by chance? Uh, would you be able to, and if you are, would you be able to let us know? Okay, well, it was a long shot, but you never know. Um, but thank you for asking the question. Hopefully this uh, lets them know and it lets anybody else know um, if they are trying to uh, compute atmospheric rivers, that capability is in there. Um, just play around with the thresholds and you should be able to back it out. Um, moving on to our next question. Uh, MetView's Python bindings offer programmatic uh, access to low level functions. Is there an equivalent in Met plus wrapper? What are the advantages of each? Um, so I, I reached out to a few individuals yesterday um, to try to gather information on this. And as it states in the document, we really don't have any expertise on our team for MetView to speak on this with any kind of authority, um, at least from what I was able to gather. Uh, I th think um, the person who asked this question actually, uh, Dave, Dave Carmen. Um, Dave, are you on the line? today? Yes, I'm here. Excellent. Um, can you kind of explain what you mean by the, the low-level function access um, that MetView provides? Sure. I was just looking. Um, I'm pretty new to MetPlus, and mm -hmm. so that's where I'm starting. I just happened to run across an article that was introducing MetView, and it looked like they had like a different paradigm for which they were using the access to the X-arrays and some of the other functions. So. 
Um, I don't have any experience in that view either. So I was just curious um, from the team if they had uh, used that approach and you know, if there was reasons why that plus would be used over that view. Um, so, so that's where I was coming from, uh, no more than that. So it sounds like uh, we're, all, we're all trying to get a better understanding of how that view introduces these um, Python bindings. So, so that's, that's good for me. Uh, if I have more detailed questions, I'll be glad to post them to the discussion forums. Yes, please. And thank you. Um, and sorry we couldn't help you this time, but uh, yeah, no John H. G. Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I would say we, we created MET and Met, the MET Plus wrappers to provide kind of systematic routine uh, verification approaches, writing to a, a, a standard output format. And our main goal is to um, make make uh, doing verification easier, more accessible, but also more consistent. Um, so it's less of a tool for research and more of a tool for consistent evaluation. That being said, when there are opportunities to generalize it to, you know, uh, to meet more needs for for people to dive into more details and do research, um, we're totally open to that. Um, but I just want to kind of point out the big picture of you know intention of the the tool the, the package in the first place. Great, yeah, thank you. That, that does help. And Dave, well, I, I'm uh, I might reach out to you about. Um, about getting more answers to this because we I would be interested to figure this out. I, I think we've had this question before and working with the Met office. Um, they do have a little familiarity with this, but not major in any way. So it, it'd be good to get this answer for you, even if it is offline later. So thanks again for asking that. Oh, no, thank you, John. John. Okay, so I'll leave that unanswered for right now, but we're going to move on to our second to last question. Uh, Ken, Regrid data plane do interpolation in the vertical. And Johnny Shi, I think you have the answer for this one. Yep. Um, short answer, no. Um, the regrading capability in MET processes one slice, one 2D field of data at a time. So the regrading can be done either with the regrid data plane tool, where you explicitly list field by field um, the data you want to regrid, or more conveniently, um, in the MET con in the configuration files in the MET tools themselves, there is a regrid dictionary. Um, so if you're comparing forecast data to observation data using grid stat, and they're both gridded data sets, and you want to uh, always regrid your forecast data to your observation grid, for example, then you can just, it's as simple as setting up the config file to tell MET to do so. Um, so that's, I, I would recommend doing it that way. Um, as far as vertical interpolation goes, um, we do handle vertical interpolation when, when doing point verification. So if you are if you have a point observation that exists between two layers of your model, and you set up the configuration file for point stat the right way, then um, Met will find the the model levels above and below the location of the observation. Well, let's assume it's on you're verifying on pressure levels. Um, it will interpolate in the horizontal to the lat long location of the observation above and below, and so it has a value for for that observation uh, lat long above and below, and then interpolates those two values uh, to the actual height of the observation linear in the log of pressure. If you're verifying uh, height levels, then it would just be linear in height from the, the, level, the layers above and below. So, um, but nothing, nothing with uh, regridding gridded fields in the vertical. Thanks, John. Appreciate that. Um, and we did get one question. Um, I saw that as the, the meeting kicked off, uh, can MET plus be used to time lane on time leg ensembles? And I think John G, you also uh, hammered out an answer for this one very quickly. Yeah, George and I collaborated on this. Um, so uh, the MET ensemble stat tool, and also new for version 10.1, there's a gen ons prod tool for generate ensemble products tool. Um, can, you know, it reads the ensemble members specified from on the command line. And typically, you users specify uh, a list of files for different models with the same initialization and lead time, but they don't have to be. 
So you can definitely pass input files from different initializations and lead times, which would be your time lagged ensemble. But in general, they should all have the same valid time. So, um, which is typically how you set up a time lagged ensemble. And I asked George if you could do this via a Met Plus wrapper, and I'll hand it off to George to to respond to that. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, so I. As far as I know, there aren't any current examples of use cases that do this, um, but in theory, it should be possible. Um, the way that I would foresee handling this is um, configuring the list of ensembles that you're going to process using the shift keyword that I dis we discussed in a previous um, lecture for uh, file name templates. So you would essentially create a list of file name templates and shift the um, the valid or init time that you want to read um, to, to define your list of, of times. Um, and if anybody's interested in um, providing it, an example that, that demonstrates this, we can, um, you can contact the team and we can work together to, to get a good example of this set up and work through any kinks that may arise. Thanks, George, and thanks, John, for that. Um, so, as I'm sure all of you have noticed, we're about two minutes over, so we won't be able to do any other questions unless somebody has something very pressing. Um, I did want to let everybody know, okay, first of all, thank you for joining. Um, secondly, as you can see for the agenda for next session, um, February 1st is what we're expecting to do. Um, we're going to try to cover the PB to NC with a use case um, for the hands-on and then moving on to an ASCII to NC with Python embedding. Again, if you're interested to know how to call these scripts to do more complicated input, this is definitely going to be a presentation you'll want to see. Um, and then there'll be a hands-on for that as well. Um, so uh, that's the uh, agenda for next week. Are there any pressing questions that anybody has before we sign off? Okay, thank you very much. Um, hope you all have a great Tuesday. Um, thanks for participating. Again, appreciate all of your questions today uh, and have a wonderful day.